Greetings, everyone, and welcome to THE 621 Lecture 6A. We're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew and look at one of the themes most central to Matthew today, and that is thinking about Jesus' relationship to the Mosaic Law. To start with, and this really gives us a chance to do sort of a more thorough introduction to Matthew, because this, this is one of Matthew's most central concerns. Uh, by a way of a word of introduction, we can see that in early Christian art, and early, already in the second century, Irenaeus tells us that the gospel writers, the evangelists, were associated with different images. Matthew is usually an angel. John is, uh, sorry, Mark here is a lion, but sort of an angelic lion. Gospel of John is an eagle, and Luke is an ox. He would get a close-up of Matthew as an angel and in an image which makes their different animals a little clearer. We see Matthew here, the angel, Mark the lion, Luke the bull, and John the eagle. And it's probably not an accident that Matthew on the left and John the eagle on the right are the most prominent gospel writers. These were, to uh, put it bluntly, the church's two favorite gospels. John for sort of plumbing the theological depths of Christ's person, and Matthew for being a full account, for being so orderly, for including so much scriptural prophecy and proof, and probably for Matthew's strict insistence on high ethical standards, which is one of the topics we'll look at today. The only other thing to say is that with this image of Matthew as an angel, is often depicted as Matthew being inspired by or spoken to by an angel. I want to start this lecture by diving right into Matthew's version of the parable of a king hosting a great wedding banquet. Because I think even from this parable and a few of its sort of unexpected lines, we can gather some information about what's on Matthew's mind as he composes this gospel. So we go to the gospel and bear with me. I know that's a lot of text, but I'll read it and highlight a few details. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, can be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He invited everyone, but they didn't want to come. They made light of it, and they all made excuses. One went to his farm, another went to his business, and so on. But the rest seized the king's slaves and killed them. Now, that's a little bit sudden and unexpected. It's one thing not to want to go to the wedding. It's another thing to kill the people who send you an invitation. If that seems like a sudden escalation, it gets worse still. The king was enraged, sent his troops, and destroyed the murderers, and burned their city. Wow, things got heated really fast. I would submit that already here, we can tell that this parable has in view the destruction of Jerusalem. The king is angry, and his city is burned. People didn't want him. But we're not done. The king says to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So the slaves go out to gather whom they could find, both good and bad. The wedding hall is filled, therefore, but when the king came to the wedding, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said, friend, how did you get here without a wedding robe? The man was speechless. And the king said, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are called, but few are chosen. I would propose that Matthew is writing his gospel, and indeed this parable, at a time where Jerusalem has been burned to the ground, and when people are joining the Christian movement who take a rather lax view about holiness. I submit that if we compare this parable to the Gospel of Luke, chapter, chapter 14 in Luke, we can see a couple of striking differences. In Luke, when the wedding banquet is not full at first, the servants are sent out to find the disenfranchised, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. But in Matthew, it's good and bad. There's a moral distinction. It's, it's a morally complex group, not a group including the disenfranchised. And then second, that means that 
instead of the parable concluding happily that the poor and disenfranchised got to taste that banquet, but the people who didn't want to come got no part of it, in Matthew, we end with a secondary lesson. Namely, it's great to get invited late to the wedding, but you better show up dressed right. And I think, surely, Matthew has in view here two facts, facts on the ground. The temple has been destroyed, and Gentiles are joining the church, and not all of them, as it were, have shown up dressed properly. If we wanted to sum up uh, some basic facts about what I think is, is partly governing Matthew's portrayal of Christ, we could go as follows. We'll start with sort of straightforward convictions that Matthew has, and we'll note where he disagrees with some other members of the early Christian movement. First, the Mosaic Law, Matthew agrees with every other Jew in the period. The law is Israel's greatest blessing, and there can't possibly be a contradiction between God's good law and the Messiah God sends to his people. We can even add a caveat here. There will be no eschatological change either, because if anything, the last days, the day of the Messiah, will simply be a time of more perfect obedience to the law, perfect interpretation of the law, a time when Gentiles finally come to learn the law. Remember what the prophet predicts. Isaiah says, in the end days, the nations, the Gentiles, will say, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to Mount Zion to learn God's ways, for out of Zion shall flow Torah, law. Isaiah 51, Torah will go forth from me, and my justice for a light to the nations. This is what's supposed to happen in the end times, is that finally the nations will give up their ridiculous ways from the Jewish perspective and adopt God's law. Fact number two, there were Christians in the first century who saw matters quite differently. Paul, for instance, although his views on Torah resist tidy summary because he has a very complicated approach, it would be fair to say that Paul can make some rather alarming statements about law, and he generally insists that Gentile believers in Christ are not bound by the law. In a convoluted way, he'll say that they actually uphold the law, and we'll get to that, and we'll, we want to do full justice to Paul's nuanced view. But Paul insists law is until Messiah. And we even know there's Christians in Paul's congregations who are more radical than Paul. We know there are Christians in the first century who say that the law is unworthy of God. It's merely symbolic or something else like that. So there's going to be some conflict between Matthew's view and the view of some of these Christians. Point number three. As we saw when we gave a survey of the life of Christ, Jesus was basically law observant. Jesus kept Torah. He never overthrew the law. He didn't disobey the law. But at the same time, we need to add that Jesus was provocative. And he did say things like, You've heard it said, supply quotation from the law, but I say to you, Jesus said things like, Moses permitted you, but from the beginning it wasn't so. And he engages in controversies about how to keep Sabbath, about purity, and so on. To use a term applied to Socrates, Jesus was a gadfly. He is picking some fights about the right interpretation of the law. And he doesn't mind speaking quite boldly. And to a more conservative Jewish Christian view, even alarmingly. All right, that's point number three. For point number four, we come to Matthew himself. And I just note that I'll try to illustrate this as we go along. But Matthew is grudgingly admiring of Pharisaic early rabbinic Judaism. The early rabbinic movement, which starts after the destruction of the temple, is led by the Pharisees. And we know they arose, they insisted on strict interpretation, they proposed alternatives and ways to cope with the loss of the temple, 
they provided the spiritual and intellectual leadership for Israel. I submit that although Matthew has the harshest things to say about the Pharisees, this is in some sense a fraternal conflict. And Matthew, as he writes, has his eye, as it were, on the synagogue across the street. And it will be Matthew who says, who has Jesus say, folks, we need to be better than the Pharisees. Your righteousness needs to exceed their righteousness. It's also Matthew who says that the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. They are the official interpreters. We do what they say, but we do it better than they do it. At the same time, Matthew knows about emerging rabbinic Judaism. I'll just give a further illustration. and It is in the Gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Matthew alone, that Jesus forbids people to call anyone rabbi. Matthew 23, verse 8. You are not to be called rabbi. You have one teacher. You are all brethren. And I think that's, it rankles for him that the term rabbi is now, in this period, starting to be used as an official term, almost like a term to which someone gets ordained to. Just to be clear here, the term rabbi means my master or my teacher. It was a Semitic term that was used before the emergence of the rabbinic period, but it's in the 80s that this term is starting to become an official designation. And Matthew says, "Uh uh-uh, we don't use that. We have one teacher. We're all brothers. Okay, I've put four facts up here. And I think within these, we can look at how Matthew shapes the story of Jesus to try to address the fact that Jesus is a gadfly and to make sense of that, to address the fact that there are Christians who, in his view, have grossly misinterpreted Jesus' relationship to Torah. and." Um, to try to tell a coherent story here. So we begin, in some ways, in the place where Jesus talks about Torah most most boldly, and that is the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, as you know, is uh, in, in many ways Jesus' most magisterial collection of teaching. Here Jesus says, not only should you not have anger, uh, not only should you not murder, but you should not even have anger. You should not only not commit adultery, but you should not even look with lust. There should be no hatred or armed resistance. In fact, there should be only a a nonviolent resistance where you pray for your enemies. Not only should you not take oaths, but you should be so utterly honest that every word is like an oath. Just simply say yes or no. Love your enemies. Do not judge. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' greatest hits. And throughout the ages, even people who don't like Christianity, even folks who find Christian metaphysics absurd or church practices annoying, will often say, Jesus was a great teacher. This is you know, sort of a cliche. Uh, and yet, despite all the admiration the Sermon on the Mount has evoked, it is probably liable to a couple of charges. And one would be that it borders on unrealistic or maybe even impossible. After all, Jesus concludes chapter 5, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Have no anger? Really? Never look with any lustful thought? Is this, is this feasible? We'll say more about that momentarily, but the other charge is that it would appear to be in some tension with the Old Testament. And I want to pick up first with that latter charge, because this, it seems like Matthew is at pains to say, this sermon does not, the way I understand it, does not contradict the Old Testament. So we start with the programmatic opening where Matthew insists, Jesus insists, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. What exactly fulfill means is something we're going to have to tease out. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And here, 
I think we see a jab at people who uh, want to relax the commandments of Moses for, for Christians, for followers of Christ. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least commandments, even one of the little ones, and tells other people it's okay to do so, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So here we have Jesus saying, please understand what I'm saying here as an intensifying of the commandments. I'm building a hedge around Torah. I'm saying we are going to be stricter than the strictest folk. I just want to illustrate a bit more ways that you can take it or leave it, but ways it looks to me like Matthew is probably uh, altering the Gospel of Mark so that it would not be liable to misunderstanding along the lines that Jesus is annulling the law. I'll give a couple examples. In one of the Sabbath controversies, in Mark chapter 2, Jesus is going through a Sabbath on the grain. On a Sabbath, he's, he and his disciples are going through a grain field. They pluck some grain, and some Pharisees pop up, as if Pharisees had nothing better to do than hide in grain fields and wait to see if anyone would pick some grain. And they get in a fight about the Sabbath. Jesus responds in a couple of ways, but the most sort of provocative statement is in verse 27 in Mark. And he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. When Matthew retells this story, which he does, basically faithfully, he leaves that verse out. And you can imagine why he might, right? You can imagine Matthew saying, whoa, that sounds a little bit scary. It sounds like you're trying to say, we can do what we want with the Sabbath, because it's for us. And it's pretty clear that Matthew imagines the rules for the Sabbath are still in force. I'll just note that in the eschatological discourse, as Jesus is describing the sun going black and the moon turning to blood and people running for their lives, and, he's, and, and Mark has, pray that this terrible end of times catastrophe not happen in winter, because those are going to be hard times. And Matthew says, pray that this not happen in winter, <gasps> and pray that it not happen on the Sabbath. I would submit to you that Matthew can only add a clause like that if Matthew is imagining that the rules for the Sabbath are still in force. And good heavens, you wouldn't want to have to run for your lives in the eschatological catastrophe on the Sabbath because you're only allowed to run a thousand cubits on the Sabbath. And so that would be complicated. You get the idea. You don't say things like that unless you think the Sabbath rules still apply. Further examples the story of whether things that go into a person can render them unclean. Matthew tones down Mark's version. Matthew agrees that you don't need to be obsessed with washing cups. What matters is holiness. But Mark concludes, as he tells this story, that it's not what goes into a person that defiles, it's what comes out. Mark adds this concluding clause, thus Jesus declared all foods clean or sometimes it's translated, thus Jesus cleansed all foods. I think Matthew goes, eh, no, 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 no. Like, he didn't, he didn't say you could eat pork. He didn't overthrow the Mosaic law. He just said, folks, let's major on inner purity and not worry about washing cups. Matthew here pulls back. and he, So he maintains these controversies, but everything from the programmatic line I've come to fulfill, not to abolish, to these sorts of statements, these sorts of adjustments to Mark. They make the point that the law is still in force. Even the little laws, even tithing the mint, dill, and cumin, they all still apply. But we as followers of Christ focus on the big picture. Hence, Matthew wants his sermon to be read not as a contradiction of the Old Testament. What about a second, the second line of critique that is sometimes raised against the Sermon on the Mount? And that is that, is it not simply unrealistic at some level? 
So I quote one passage ancient and one passage more or less contemporary to illustrate this concern. Justin Martyr, Christian apologist in the second century, had a multiple day dialogue with Trypho the Jew. And Trypho admires what he finds in the gospel, but he notes a, a reasonable concern. He says, I'm aware that your precepts in this gospel are wonderful, but I gotta be honest, mate, I suspect no one can keep them. That's just beyond human capacity. And more recently, Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov has the Grand Inquisitor state bluntly, Jesus judged humanity too highly. It was created weaker and lower than Christ thought. This is a problem that Christians have always wrestled with, and there have been a few interpretive strategies for what would it mean to have to be without any sort of lust, to have to be without any sort of anger. One strategy has been to say that Jesus is giving what later Christians came to call evangelical counsels, that is, counsels only for those who want to be perfect. In other words, Jesus gives a two-tiered system. There's grade A Christians who get everything right, and that's what the Sermon on the Mount's for, and there's hoi polloi who just do their best. The exegetical basis for this would be the fact that Jesus says, be perfect, and later in the Gospel of Matthew, we find this interrogation of the rich young ruler, what must I do for eternal life? Jesus says, keep the commandments. The guy says, yeah, I did that. And Jesus says, well, if you want to be perfect, sell all you have and give it to the poor. That's a tricky passage to interpret. It's not clear if Jesus means, no, you didn't really keep the commandments yet because you still have too much money. Or is Jesus saying, hey, fine, you've done the normal, kept your nose clean type righteousness, but if you want perfection, I've got a second way, a higher way. We see this interpretation as early as the Didache. So this is written at the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. It's very early. And it's catechetical instruction for someone being baptized. And they're supposed to recite the commandments. And <laughs> I find this kind of amusing. They're told, if you are able to bear the whole yoke of the Lord, yoke is a term for the commandments, if you can keep the whole yoke of the Lord, you will be perfect. But if you are unable, just do what you can. I always find this amusing because it's like, yeah, you know, it is asking a lot. So you know what? We're baptizing you. Just can you just do your best? As much as this is a line of interpretation of the very demanding Jesus that we find in the Sermon on the Mount, I don't think it's Matthew's way of understanding the Sermon on the Mount. And I'll show you why. Who does Matthew say Jesus is talking to? When the Sermon on the Mount concludes, it's clear he's teaching the crowds. He's not teaching an inner circle of spiritual elites. This is what he teaches everyone. And the Gospel of Matthew concludes, go make disciples of everybody and teach them to do what I commanded. Commanded where? In places like the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, Jesus' instruction in the Sermon on the Mount is meant for everyone. So we're still stuck with our problem. What's going on? How, this surely is psychologically just a very high expectation for people. I'll describe another line of interpretation. And that is that maybe the sermon, in the sermon, Jesus is pointing to impossible ideals to illustrate the need for grace. Here you can have, here you can hear notes of a sort of Lutheran interpretation. What the law does and what Jesus in radicalization of the law does is shows people their need for grace. So Jesus says, be really, really, really good. And then people say, oh my gosh, I can't do it. Please just have mercy on me, a sinner. This may be a valid theological observation about how law and commandment work but it ain't Matthew's point. Matthew insists in every way Matthew possibly can. You've got to do this stuff. So still in the sermon, Jesus says, folks, you gotta hear this stuff and do it. If you don't do it, you're a fool. 
it will get you nowhere. It actually gets rather harsh there in the end of chapter 7. Jesus says, you know what? When I come, anyone who hasn't done what I said, even if they say, Lord, we knew you. We cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your name. So someone who knows Jesus pretty well and did miracles, Jesus says, I will say to that person, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. So Matthew's like, no, this is disgusting. Of course you have to do what Jesus says. Jesus, Matthew says, has this point reiterated again and again. The Son of Man will come, he will repay everyone according to their deeds. Everyone will be judged according to every least word they say, so on and so forth. So we're back to our original problem. How does Matthew expect the Sermon on the Mount to be heard? How is it going to be consistent with the Old Testament? And how is it going to be consistent with human realities? That it's very hard to do. It's impossible to do the things Jesus demands. And yet, Matthew insists you've got to do them. I want to propose that we sort of let Matthew interpret Matthew on this score. And I hope this isn't too subtle for a lecture, but I want to draw out a couple themes. One is to say that, look, if Matthew starts by saying the sermon is consistent with the law and the prophets, then we would make a mistake if we turn Jesus' teaching into a brand new law, if by law we meant something to be very uh, legalistically applied. In fact, Jesus' teaching here in the sermon is actually phrased in such a way that it defies easy legal analysis. He says, you need to pluck out your eye. You need to cut off your hand. Well, you can't, you can't provoke that to a sort of casuistic analysis and say, well, exactly how deep do you make the gouge in the eye or where do you cut off the hand? It doesn't work that way. He's giving images. The images are quite serious. He means them. He's addressing a serious question. Uh, he's saying, should you prioritize health and well-being or should you prioritize righteousness? That's an age-old question and a difficult one to answer. What constitutes human flourishing? Righteousness or general well-being? Jesus says, my answer is righteousness. Do you want me to make that answer really clear? I would prefer you mutilate yourself rather than be unrighteous. I really mean it, folks. I'm emphasizing the righteousness side of this age-old debate, of this continuum. And I think, to quote uh, Westerholm, a great interpreter of Matthew, if Jesus' demands are framed more poetically than legally, it is because poetry evokes a vision, and Jesus' demands can only be met by those who have been captured by a vision and live in its light. That's a nice phrase. Apropos of the question of the law and the Old Testament, Jesus' commandments and the Old Testament, Jesus is assuming you know your Old Testament and you know that the law and the prophets include armies. So you have to interpret turn the other cheek in light of the fact, yeah, God also sometimes issues armies. You have to interpret the command not to take an oath in light of the fact that God, God's self takes oaths in the Old Testament. God tells people to take oaths. There are courts where people have to take oaths. So you're supposed to use a measure of interpretive nuance. And Matthew illustrates this by having his character, star character Jesus, embody his own teaching. And by embodying it, he interprets it. Let me indicate what I mean a little bit. Blessed are the meek. What does meekness mean for Matthew? Well, let the Jesus of the Gospel of Matthew interpret meekness. Jesus says, I am meek. And yet, what does that mean? This is the same Jesus who goes into the temple and drives out the sellers almost violently. This is the Jesus, the same Jesus who says, don't call your brother a fool, calls the Pharisees fools in chapter 23. I don't point that out to say, aha, we caught Matthew in a little contradiction. Quite the contrary. Here's the point. Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, take your words very seriously. Words count as much as actual murder. He's also saying, folks, I'm not giving a list of prohibited terms. 
When I say don't call your brother fool, I don't mean there's never a time to get angry and call your brother fool. I might have to do that. I call my brothers the Pharisees fools. There's a time for holy anger, and yet words are dangerous and count. Matthew's holding these truths in tension. And Jesus for Matthew is the way to figure out how you interpret his commandments. The commandments are binding. They're serious, but they're not inflexible. Serious, but not inflexible. To quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer, since Jesus is the incarnate love of God for human beings, he is not the proclaimer of abstract ethics, but the one who concretely enacts God's love. Jesus is the embodiment of what his ethics look like. We see this throughout Matthew in all sorts of ways, and if you read carefully, you'll see it. Jesus teaches about prayer, pray in private. He himself prays alone multiple times in Matthew. He says, here's how you pray, our Father. He himself prays, our Father. He says that you should look for God's will to be done, which is precisely what he prays in the garden. He says, don't bring us into the time of trial, it should be your prayer. This is precisely what he prays, and so on and so forth. I pause here, but I think the sermon is front and center for Matthew because it's Matthew's way of saying, no folks, Jesus didn't come to offer a cheap grace. It's a very costly grace. But Matthew also wants to say, this isn't wooden. It's not supposed to be a list of do's and don'ts. It is an embodied ethic, and Christ is the one who embodies it. I want to look at a topic that I'll call Jesus as law and lawgiver. Because Matthew portrays Jesus as a second Moses, and indeed as an embodied law. Not only a second lawgiver, but the law incarnate. Note the parallel between the way Jesus speaks of the law of Moses, the law will not pass away, and then of his own words. Matthew gives every indication that he intends to present Jesus as a second Moses. Already as an infant, Matthew 2.20, there are people seeking his life. This is a verbatim quotation from Exodus 4.19, where Moses as an infant has to flee those seeking his life. Just as Moses passed through the Jordan River and, sorry, Moses passed through the Red Sea and then is in the wilderness for 40 years, so Jesus passes through the waters of his baptism and is then tested for 40 days in the wilderness. In fact, whom does he quote at that point but Moses and speaks of God's providential supply of bread and so on. We see other ways that Matthew depicts Jesus as the prophet whom Moses promised. So Moses himself on uh, the mountain, because of his contact with God, his face shines. And Moses promises that in the end times, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. Listen to him. Matthew makes it unmistakable that Jesus is that prophet. Jesus ascends the Mount of Transfiguration, his face shines, and the voice from heaven declares, listen to him. There's more than just showing, there's more to Matthew's depiction than simply showing that Jesus is a second Moses, though. Jesus is also embodied wisdom and law. This is a little complicated, but I think I can make it relatively clear, and you'll see some of the dynamics in the Gospel of Matthew. First of all, Jesus speaks as wisdom. He says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. This is his response to criticism. And in a passage just following that, where you might not as immediately notice wisdom uh, echoes, evocations of wisdom, I'll, I'll show you that they're, that they're here. So in a particularly striking passage in Matthew 11, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. That is, thank you, God, for not revealing yourself to stupid Bible scholars, people like myself here. Thank you for hiding it from them and revealing it to babes. Yes, Father, this was your pleasure. Everything has been given to me by my Father. No one knows the Son but the Father. No one knows the Father but the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
That's shocking. He says, you will not learn about God by reading this book. Torah scholars won't help you. I know God, and I reveal God. Nobody else. It's a statement about where revelation is to be found. He then goes on to say, to issue an invitation. Come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle. Meek is the word. And lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To unpack the background of this, we need to say a word about how wisdom was personified in the Old Testament. In the book of Proverbs, we get illustrations of wisdom being her own person. The word for wisdom in Hebrew, chokmah, or in Greek, sophia, they're feminine grammatically. And wisdom has an existence of her own. God's wisdom speaks. She says that the Lord created her at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago, before the beginning of the earth. God consults with wisdom when he creates. That means that wisdom can issue invitations to come to her, to, to, to find nourishment from her. We can say a bit more about this. Wisdom was imagined to have sought a place on earth to dwell. And there are a couple ways this story is told, this myth. In one Jewish text, First Enoch, Wisdom seeks a place to dwell on earth, but there was no appropriate place, so she returned to heaven and dwells among the angels. Here's a pessimistic version. There is no wisdom on earth. There's only wisdom in heaven. In another version of the same story, wisdom seeks a place to dwell on earth, and she finds it among the Israelites. She says, where should I abide? And the creator said, make your dwelling in Jacob. In Israel, find your inheritance. And where does she and how does she dwell in Israel? The book of Sirach continues and makes clear. This wisdom who, who, with her familiar voice, says, come to me and eat your fill. She says, Sirach makes clear, this is the book of the covenant. This is the law of Moses. So wisdom and Torah are now identified in this second century text, Sirach. So Ben Sira has a different version than First Enoch about the same time, sort of different ways of saying, where is wisdom? This means that in Sirach, when wisdom issues these calls to draw near, to acquire wisdom, to put your neck under her yoke, that is simultaneously the call to take up the study of Torah. You can hear resonances of Jesus' statement in Matthew here in a couple passages from Sirach, where he says, uh, See with your own eyes that I have labored but little and found much rest. Put your feet in wisdom's fetters and your neck in her yoke, and you will find the rest she gives. Wisdom will offer rest. She offers it in the study of Torah. What if we come back to this saying in the Gospel of Matthew? First of all, I hope it's obvious that how clear it is that Matthew is having Jesus speak as wisdom. Everything has been hidden from the wise and understanding. That is, Matthew is entering into a debate here with texts like 1st Enoch and Sirach, because when you make a claim about where wisdom dwells, you're also saying how people should learn wisdom. Let me tease that out. In First Enoch, if you claim that wisdom is only in heaven, who's going to get wisdom for you? Well, you need an esoteric book like First Enoch, which claims to be written by Enoch of Genesis chapter 5, who was lifted up straight into heaven, a man who never tasted death. If, according to the book of Sirach's version, you think that wisdom dwells in Torah, then you need a Torah scholar who can unpack the nuances of a complicated text and thereby help you get wisdom. Jesus, in Matthew, enters into that sort of discussion and says, no, it's not up in heaven. You don't need an esoteric seer. And it's not in Torah such that you need a scholar. It is living in me. Come to me, you who are weary. I'll give you that rest. This is where you get Torah. 
This is where you get nourishment. It's about living discipleship, not just about study. Torah involves discipleship. It involves becoming like a child. You don't call anyone rabbi because you have one teacher, the Christ. And so my point is that Matthew is not just doing this for the sake of artistry. It has an implication. It has an implication about knowledge. And that is to say, knowledge doesn't simply follow from study. Knowledge follows from revelation, from discipleship. Look at a passage like Matthew 13. Every scribe who has been discipled for the kingdom of heaven, made a disciple for the kingdom, is someone who can bring out treasure of what is new and what is old. That fits so well for Matthew. Something incredibly new has happened, and yet what it is is a recapitulation of promises from long ago. I just want to conclude by thinking about this still troubling and challenging statement. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What can that mean? Jesus knows he's asking a lot of people. How can he make this claim? I think the way the Gospel of Matthew would answer is that Jesus, first of all, has not asked anything of others he hasn't done. He has embodied his own instruction. Two, Matthew insists from the very first chapter that Jesus is always with people. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus repeats this, where two or three are gathered, I am with them, chapter 18. Chapter 28, verse 20, the last verse of the book, I am with you always. And that withness, that being with, contrasts precisely what Jesus says about heavy burdens. He says the Pharisees make heavy burdens and they don't lift a finger. So in a sense, he's not saying entirely my burden is easy. He's saying it will be easy for you because I'm with you. I also think that for Matthew, Matthew doesn't envision a bare command, a sort of naked thou shalt. He envisions someone being enticed and captured by a desire for the kingdom. So think of an almost uh, outrageous parable, like like the one we find only in Matthew, in chapter 13, where Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to what is frankly an immoral scenario, to someone who finds a treasure in a field, and then instead of doing the right thing by telling the owner of the field, hey, buddy, great news, you've got treasure in your field. Instead, he hides the treasure so that the owner doesn't find it, and then he goes and liquidates his possessions so he can buy that field. No doubt, not for the price it deserves. And Jesus says that's what the kingdom's like. Now, of course, Jesus isn't trying to teach a moral lesson. He's saying how the kingdom operates. The point of that is that does the kingdom demand you sell all you have? Yes, it does. Does that feel like a burden? No. The person in in this parable, in this scenario, doesn't wring his hands and say, oh, gosh, I don't want to do this. It's going to be awful, but I better sell my possessions so I can get some kingdom. The person in this parable wants to sell his possessions because he's going to get something better. He's going to get a field with a treasure in it. And I think that's Jesus' way of saying, when people get a glimpse of the kingdom, does the kingdom demand parting with possessions? Yes, it does. Is that painful for the person as they do it? Not if they've gotten a glimpse of the kingdom. It's actually almost automatic. And that's revelatory. It's not something that can simply be worked out. They've got to catch that glimpse. They've got to find the treasure. We have to bring to a close our study of the Gospel of Matthew, which is a pity. I love the Gospel of Matthew. There are riches in every chapter, but this is an introductory unit, and we move on in the next lecture to another wonderful Gospel, namely the Gospel of Luke, who will tell the life of Jesus, bringing out some yet different aspects of Jesus' life and uh, sort of telling the song, playing the song in a different key. So join me next time for the Gospel of Luke.